Hello and welcome to the MacGuffin Podcast. I'm John and I'm here with Chris Strompolis and Eric Zala. They are two filmmakers behind Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Adaptation. And that is a film, if you haven't heard of it, where back in 1982, these two men, along with some friends, set about making a shot-for-shot remake of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Thanks for having us on. It's our pleasure. And so before Raiders came along, did you ever have any interest in filmmaking or acting? Well, I think it was probably Raiders that probably, you know, kind of got us started. I mean, I was a big Star Wars fan, so mm-hmm. translated a lot of that sort of nerdy passion, you know, from the Star Wars world into into Raiders. Uh, you know, I don't know if I necessarily had any interest in acting or filmmaking, but, you know, uh, I think Raiders, you know, doing Raiders and having the idea and stuff like that probably was the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did a class film in sixth grade, which Chris saw. We rode on the bus to elementary school together, and he, as a result, mistakenly thought I knew something about film. So when he got this wacky idea to remake Raiders Lost Ark shot for shot, um, that and the fact that I borrowed his Raiders Lost Ark comic book on the bus is what led him to give me a call and say, hey, I'm remaking Raiders Lost Ark, do you want to help? And I thought all the sets were built, everyone was cast, I just sort of walk on and help. Little did I know, the only thing that Chris had done at that point was buy the published screenplay and, as any good producer will do, cast himself as Indiana Jones. <laughs> and what about Raiders in specific spoke to you at that time as a 12-year-old? You know, it's a perfect adventure film. It's, uh, I mean, there are very few films that have such a... a, a amazingly sublime effect you know that is Chris often says you know uh, split his brain open you know and I, I you know and when I saw it I just was completely blown away just absolutely transfixed transported into the, that uh, world and uh, you know I think such a powerful effect that I mean we wanted to inhabit that world as best as we could and what better way to trace the footsteps of the masters I mean and 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 make our own film. I mean, Chris wanted to be Indiana Jones as director. I wanted to see, I mean, what would a shot-for-shot remake of Raiders of the Lost Ark using teenage actors look like? The only way to answer that was to make it. Nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the time, you were inspired by Raiders. You wanted to go out and make a film. Was there ever any idea of developing an original screenplay, or was it always, I love Raiders, I want to make Raiders? No, I don't. I don't think we. You know, I, I think it. Uh, the the whole sort of originating idea was really born out of more of a role playing thing. It was a it was a fantasy. It was yeah, a creative project ensued and and a, and a lifelong collaboration ensued. But I don't think it was ever like. I don't ever think it entered our minds. You know, uh, like we sat down and and thought, okay, well, we're about to put a, a whole you know, the next seven years of our lives into a creative project. What else do you want to work on? You know, what other what other things that it's like? This is what we're doing, and we're kind of going for it, and and we had no long uh, no idea how long it was going to take us, mm-hmm. so we sort of dove in and did it. So I don't I don't know if we had that sort of um, that spectrum of creative thinking yet. I think it was just like, hey, this is it. This is what we're doing. Mm. Wouldn't it be exciting if? And we just sort of went after it with that childlike energy, you know. Mm. So I don't think there was any deliberating. (laughs) (laughs) And what was the pre-production process like? Was there a lot of planning, a lot of meetings, uh, getting together with any crew you might have had? Well, you know, as a as a uh, 11 and 12 year old respectively growing up in Mississippi in the uh, 80s pre-internet um, with we pretty much sort of you know how do you remake a 26 million dollar movie on your allowance you know we knew nothing about it and and for the first year so we kind of figuratively speaking groped around in the darkness as far as figuring out how you do that you know I wrote a 600 page shot list and then it got to the end and realized it was utterly worthless you know close up and he walks into room I mean, what are you gonna do with that and, and then figured out okay no storyboards that's how the professionals do it yeah yeah and it was sort of by osmosis uh, filmmaking on the fly and and about so if the f- first summer was entirely nothing but pre-production, drawing storyboards, scouting locations, casting, costumes, props. Year two, we finally shot, kept none of it because again, we didn't know anything about filmmaking. Um, 
so there's very few shots that, that we actually kept from that first year, but there are certain scenes that we just would shoot over and over and over again. Through uh, trial and error, we slowly picked up things about uh, learning about composition, lighting, blocking, acting, and bit by bit we got better. And only when we were satisfied with uh, the quality of a shot and of a scene would we move on to the next. That's one real advantage to remaking a film, and we didn't have the foresight of knowing this in advance, but you know, if you're making an original and something's inconvenient, you can just cut it out. I mean, where are we going to get a boulder? Fine, no boulder. Uh, well, you know, everyone knows Raiders Lost Ark. There has to be a boulder. Um, so it kind of held our feet to the fire uh, in terms of forcing us to find creative solutions and stretching us further than we would have otherwise. And um, one thing that was really interesting that I found out through this process of researching your film is that Raiders wasn't out on video when you undertook this, you know, massive undertaking that yeah, it we, ended up being. People always ask us, you know, because it... They, they seem to think that, uh, you know, we watched the film a thousand times, you know, mm -hmm. to, and we only actually saw the movie a few times, you know, uh, uh, and worked pretty much from memory for the first handful of years until the film actually came out on Laserdisc in 84. And so, as Eric mentioned, you know, we cobbled together absolutely everything that we could in terms of you know, Raiders paraphernalia, you know, um, storybooks and magazines and, and bubblegum cards and, and all that stuff, the comic book and the screenplay and, and to the best of our memory sat down and, and Eric, you know, chiseled out well over 600 individual storyboards that we then used as a blueprint. But we, you know, we went back to the theater as much as that we could, but, um, you know, for those of us who kind of remember the 80s, there were... Their, in video stores were really in their infancy that you couldn't really go down and rent whatever you wanted you know um, there was an availability issue you know and and it was in a movie when they kind of re-released things so when the movie was re-released in the theater we went back and watched it you know again as much as our you know allowance would allow you know <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah as a result um, we've seen our own movie you know, because any any filmmaker watches their own film a billion times in the process of making it or screening it. We've probably seen our own film a hundred times for every one time that we've seen the original Raiders, actually. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when I do watch the original Raiders, I have the surreal experience, it seems this can make no sense, and make no mistake, the original is the superior film, but I feel like I'm watching a big budget remake of our movie, if that makes any sense, it's very bizarre. I, I echo that. I mean, it's really, it's 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 a bizarre, it's a bizarre sensation, you know, to watch a, to watch a film, you know, that changed your life, but feel like it was something, somebody else remade of, you know, because I think the experience is so ingrained in us, mm. you know, that 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 our, the Raiders' journey was just like it was so uh, life changing and sort of imprinted itself in such a profound way those many years that, you know, I, I just see myself in the hat and I see Angela in the <laughs> white dress and I smell Eric's basement, you know, it's, and, it's part and, of childhood. you know, and, and I, I hear the sounds and I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very visceral, reversed kind of odd experience. Mm. Uh, can you tell me what a day in the shoot would be like? Just maybe from the when you woke up in the morning, going down through. What are some things that stick out? What a day would be like on the set of the Raiders adaptation? Huh. You want to choose a scene. Let's say um, the scene where Marion's introduced at the bar. Ah, so most of the interiors we shot in my mom's basement, which had this big rambling basement, multiple rooms. So uh, we would we'd only shoot in the summertime. Um, you know, it was like summer camp. You know, we we do production, pre-production during the school year, but during the summer that was our time. So uh, think 120% humidity, typical <laughs> Mississippi summer day. Um, we'll start early and, um, and uh, saunter down to the basement where, you know, it's made up like a Nepalese saloon with my dad's old wine bottles lining the uh, lining the uh, the shelves and, and Jason our cameraman is wiring up squibs to go off in the wall um, and uh, we have uh, you know the the Nepali saloon nearly burns down and um, our moms had shut us down the previous summer because well they spotted a shot with me with my back on fire and 
for some reason had a problem with this. Um, so, but they allowed us to continue with uh, two words, adult chaperone. We found an adult even less responsible than we were. And so um, he helped us uh, guide us to when, you know, there wasn't enough fire in certain edges of the frame, you know, more, more gasoline over there. It's a wonder we didn't burn the house down. Don't try this at home, kids. Um, so uh, a typical day, mm, as director, is kind of like herding cats sometimes, neighborhood kids, you know. Everyone very professional. Everyone knows their lines. Nobody flakes. Yeah, right. Um, it was uh, a real test of, uh, of, of patience at times. Um, uh, challenging. I don't know. Anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, no, all the shoots were different. It was just sort of, yeah, it just, I, I would think probably not unlike a real film set, you know, there's always that element of chaos. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always that element of, of trying to kind of well, where's this and where's that and does this, this person ready yet and you know get your costume on and da da da, da and do you you know and, and and there's just set up and setting up the camera and setting up the shot and you know is everybody ready and there's just a lot of coordinating you know there's just a lot of um, plate spinning you know and um, <laughs> yeah. it's not hard to find a neighborhood kid who thinks it would be fun to play Indiana Jones for an afternoon it is challenging to find a <coughs> core group of kids who come back year after year after year, and we, we uh, our end, ending credits have about 60 names in them, and ranging from kids who showed back year after year to those who came by one year and had enough, and that was that was it. Um, so, uh, but our, the trick, you know, um, and I, I think probably what made us unusual as opposed to other pro uh, kids playing Indiana Jones is that we kind of kept going when it wasn't fun. Mm. Um, and that was an important life lesson for us back then. And uh, Eric, in addition to directing, you also played Belloc. Uh, what was it like not only being a first-time 12-year-old director, but also having to act at the same time? Uh, the process basically resembles schizophrenia. Um, you know, it was uh, challenging um, to because I couldn't really watch the shot while it was going on first and foremost, so I had to trust that the cameraman was doing it as, as storyboarded. Also, uh, you know, when you're running around in a dirt pit, you know, in a white suit and have to stay clean the whole time when you're surrounded by mud cake Mississippi kids um, in the sweaty summer, that's tough too. Now it's uh, it was a it was a challenge, um, but uh, the only reason why I am Belloc is because well, damn it, I, I knew I wasn't gonna flake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Chris, what did, did you take from Harrison Ford? Like when you were watching the movie mm -hmm. uh, in the theaters, were you taking mental notes during the re-releases, or how did you embody Harris the Harrison Ford persona? Well, that's a good question. I I, I think it's just. Um, I think it's osmosis, you know. You just you kind of you kind of watch it and and um, and uh, you know look at the photographs and get the get the feel of uh, of um, I'm so sorry. The, the noise is so distracting. Um, <laughs> All the fans, you just can't keep yeah. them back. <laughs> back people, wait for the movie. Um, is it okay? Yeah. Oh, continue. Okay. Um, yeah, I just think you know, I, I was uh, I was such a big Harrison Ford fan. You know, I was a big Han Solo fan. You know, of course. And and so I think you know Harrison's mannerisms and you know his general sort of persona and his energy and his sort of swagger and his his um, he's he's just a wonderful physical actor. You know, if you watch him, you know he's got just a, a such a noted signature kind of physicality about him, his expressions and his fingers and his, you know, his uh, his facial expressions and everything that he does. Um, it was very, very easy, not easy, but but it was, um, you know, it was a, a situation where it, it just kind of got into me. You know, I watched it over and over, I looked at pictures, I listened to sounds, I watched him, you know, and um, also Eric, Eric kind of directed me well, you know. Uh, you know, so I think with all those elements, um, I mean, that was really my main kind of 
motivation is to is to be Harrison and to be indie, you know, and 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 wear the jacket and wear the hat and do it well, and and so that was my job, you know, and uh, and I and so. It's funny. I, I don't really remember thinking about it too much. Mm. It just sort of. I think the process of living Raiders for all those years, unusual that a film production is stretched over such a long period of time that it, I think it was, did become, um, if not innate, uh, unconscious. Right. That, you know, when you, you put on the hat and, you know, you probably practice that, you know, indie smirk in the bathroom mirror, you know, so many times. Oh, that, yeah. You know, it just kind of took over. Sure. And, uh and was natural, and, and feedback that we've gotten is that Chris actually does a damn good job channeling Harrison uh, in it, particularly in certain key moments, like after he shoots the Arabian swordsman and turns around, you know, and, and uh, you know, the expression, just little touches. Mm. Well, that's great. That's obviously one of the most classic scenes in Raiders, so, sure. I mean, good on you pulling it off so well. <laughs> and uh, from what I've heard, the budget for the film was about $5,000, and being 12 years old, even though it went through to when you were 19, how does someone amass that much money? I mean, when I was that young, that seemed like the richest person I knew would have $5,000. Well, that's a that's a guesstimate, and that, that is a total amount of money, I think, probably, you know, <laughs> more in, like... It, cash that we got through the years, everything from delivering pizzas to odd jobs that we worked from, e you know, uh, uh, counting you know, birthdays and Christmas yeah. gifts, you know, which were, which was our main way of acquiring things that cost real cash, like a real leather jacket or a bullwhip. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and it wasn't, um, well, we, we didn't like get our budget and then start to work. Mm. It was, uh, kind of, uh, figure out, figure it out, and pay things as we kind of went along, you know. Made, and made five bucks uh, a week <coughs> on uh, allowance, so we weren't dealing with a, a lot of cash. Um, you know, we uh, again, you know, uh, which forced us to be uh, resourceful. Um, but we begged, borrowed, built, you know, what we needed, and uh, and managed to managed to make it work. Um, like. Uh, where do a, a couple of teenagers get a truck that they can bash the hell out of? Well, we found this abandoned truck behind this cottage and pulled it out of the swamp and put new tires and spray painted it army green and, you know, faked a hood ornament with the one metal end of an old towel rack wired to the hood of the uh, truck, you know. I, I, you know, truthfully, we don't know if it was 5000 or 3000 or 6000 Um that's really, it's like, well, gosh, what did we spend? It was seven years. That's a long time, right? So, you know, truthfully, we, we have no idea. Yeah, I mean, if we had to go back and, and gather receipts and, and actually <laughs> make those numbers, prove those numbers, it just would be impossible. We'd never be able to do it. <laughs> And what was post-production like? How was the editing set up? Were you going tape to tape since you filmed on VHS? Yes, uh, it's a daunting task, uh, facing the task of editing six years' worth of previous footage um, for the first time. But we were excited to finally get the, ch the chance to do that. Chris's mom worked at the local TV station. We got a chance to use the editing equipment when it wasn't being used, from 10 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning. So for the remainder of the summer, we live like vampires. Um, Chris, Jason, and I jammed in this little editing cubicle and, and going in you know, total old school linear editing, um, master slave deck, and um, but it was after so long, it was sheer bliss to finally put these shots together, not just in my head, because I wanted to see uh, how it would finally come together, but to have it finally uh, be edited, the best shots, put in order, and set to John Williams' score um, was sublime um, and tough. Um, you know, it, it was, uh, we finished uh, Picture Lock and then turn to the sound and, uh, and uh, you know, we, you know, tensions ran high and we, uh, uh, Chris and Jason, uh, uh, you know, slapped on a few sound effects on one night in which I wasn't there and declared it done. I said, no, it's not done. And, you know, it drove off in a cloud of dust and uh, we didn't talk for like the whole uh, uh, next year until the following summer where Last Crusade came out. And I called up Chris and said, hey, I know we're not talking and all, but you want to watch Last Crusade? And we went to the theater and saw it. And uh, as I knew it would, um, 
inspired Chris um, and myself to get back in the editing room and finish the sound. And so that's what we did the very final summer um, of 89. And then uh, Chris's mom rented out a local uh, high, uh, bottling plant auditorium and we invented, invited about 200 friends and family and had a, uh, a pr- world premiere, as it were. <laughs> Something that takes seven years uh, to make deserves a party, right? Yeah. And were there any any thoughts after the film was completed of trying to find distribution, or did you kind of know that all the copyright issues would affect the movie? I didn't think about it. I mean, it was never... I think we just... It was one of those things that we did it for the love of it. We did it for ourselves. We had no intention of really doing any sort of distribution or selling it. It was just went... We showed it for friends and family, and we were thrilled that we, we completed it, and then it went on the shelf, you know. Um, we did, I think, I think we edited it. We made our own sort of, like, edit tapes and put together our own college things. You know, we used it at, to, to get into college. But uh, that was the only thing that, that we ever used it for. Um, but, uh, yeah, never, never really had, had that in mind. And what happened after the movie was done? You had your premiere and then went to school, the 90s happened. What was going on during that time period? Did you continue with a filmmaking career, either of you? Well, by the time we finished, you know, we started when, we were, when I was 12 years old and finished when I was 19, a sophomore at NYU Film School. So, yeah, our little, our little film did uh, change the direction of my life, obviously, as I, I went on to, uh, to go to uh, film school at NYU. Um, wrote and directed a, uh, a short a drama, which Chris actually drove from Ohio to act in. Um, did well in the film festival circuit, then uh, moving to Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, you know, I dust off my copy every now and again, played, um, you know, after work about once a year, became a tradition. Everyone would cheer and love it, but, you know, didn't think much of it. And, and that all that uh, all sort of ended as I pressed eject, you know, to get my VHS copy out again. So I didn't really know what we had until it was discovered quite by accident in 2003 by Eli Roth, who got into Spielberg's hands, and uh, we screened it at the Alamo Drafthouse Theater in Austin, Texas, and and uh, Harry Knowles of Ain't It Cool News wrote an amazing review, and that, you know, changed everything, this little film that wasn't so much as a rumor on the internet. Um, they're talking about across the world, and... Uh, and uh, yeah, things got really interesting after that. <laughs> and how about for you, Chris, your post uh, Raiders life? I, uh, I kind of tucked it away, you know, I put it on the shelf and, and uh, went off to college and studied acting and studied music. And, and then, you know, literally I had just kind of tucked it away. In fact, I mean, I, I, mean, I showed it to friends here and there, um, but I think as I, exited college and tried to forge a new way through the entertainment business, you know, as an artist and, and as a creative person. Um, I think, uh, and, I've, and I've talked about this before, well, we've talked about this, but I think there was an element of it where I was actually almost embarrassed about it. Childish thing, right? Yeah, and it was a, it was a time during my, my childhood that I sort of, I kind of tucked it away. You know, it was this this weird nerdy thing that I did, and I kind of I kind of tucked it away. I mean, in fact, I mean, not that it was, not that it was um, a shameful thing that I didn't I didn't tell her, but I got married, and I, I I didn't even tell my wife I was an Indiana Jones fan, so she had no idea that I had even done this Raiders thing, and so when it got discovered in two thousand and three, and like exploded you know, and got us into Vanity Fair, and we were all of a sudden touring around the United States and going to Germany and Australia, and, you know, my wife was like, um, so what's this Raiders thing, you know? I mean, can you, like, let me see it? You know, I'm like, eh, it's like this thing that I did, and, you know, I still had that, like, that reaction, you know? <laughs> and she's like, this is cool, this is great. So, so, uh, I think, I think it's interesting because it's, um, the Raiders thing, it's, it's, uh, it's opened up another chapter, you know, it's, it's like, okay, well, I was able to experience it in one capacity as a, as a child in this way, mm-hmm. you know, and then with its rediscovery, it's, it's done several really, I think, important things in my own life, which is, you know, one, it's brought me back to my best friend, you know, because we had a, a falling out and we all kind of went our separate ways. So it's reunited friendships. Um, it's 
uh, got me back on track creatively, which is back to the thing that I love to do, which is making movies. You know, I just want to produce movies. That's all I want to do. You know, it's really all I want to do. It's all I ever wanted to do, you know. Um, and, uh, and it's also allowed me, I think, probably to lay to rest a lot of those you know, strange ghosts, you know, from a, from a childhood being able to take our film that we did, which has a notable purity to it and see it through the eyes of other people in theaters around the world where they're able to experience that joy and experience that purity and, and have a good time and be inspired and, um, and then, and experience it in a joyful way myself. And so that that that's that's been the journey for me after after it's kind of put away, and um, uh, yeah. <laughs> and as you mentioned, Eric, uh, Steven Spielberg eventually heard about the film. Uh, you got the screenings. The internet was abuzz with talks about it. What actually did, did you hear from Spielberg or from any of his people? Well, in two thousand three, when each of us. <coughs> out of the blue get a, an email uh, from Eli Roth saying this might sound strange but Steven Spielberg has seen your Little Raiders movie and he loves it he wants to write you a letter of appreciation we're all I think had similar reactions like alright who's pulling my leg right <laughs> this, this kind of thing doesn't happen but um, talking to Eli I realized that okay this is for real we each gave him our address and sure enough about a week later each of us um, received a very kind letter from Mr. Spielberg thanking us for our very loving and detailed tribute. And uh, my wife actually, you know, photographed me at various stages of opening the letter and just sort of like gazing down, on, you know, stationary Steven Spielberg and, you know, his signature and, you know, this, my boyhood hero who I spent my entire childhood emulating his, his work. Um, uh, wow, it can't get any better than this, but I was wrong. Um, you know, jump forward a year, and we've been screening and written up in Vanity Fair, and uh, we're in Los Angeles doing the Today Show and uh, the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn, and we get a call from our agent. We have an agent now. Um, Spielberg wants to meet you in his office tomorrow at noon. God, <laughs> I was doing okay handling all this up to this point, but now I feel kind of sick. Um, but uh, we uh, we obviously showed. Um, we didn't tell him we were busy. Um, and uh, we visit him on the Universal lot within the Amblin complex, and he spent about 45 minutes with us. It was remarkable, um, you know, talking about life, raiders, movies, um, all manner of things, and uh, he even um, invited us uh, to watch the bloopers reel from uh, Raiders and, and Temple of Doom, and it was a sense sitting in Spielberg's office uh, watching Which is this. totally amazing, by the way. Yeah. I tried to commit <laughs> his, as much of it to memory as crazy. possible. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I'm watching something that probably only cast or crew of the original films have, have seen. And, uh, and uh, it's really something meeting your, your boyhood hero and finding that you've chosen your hero as well. Mm. And, uh, Chris, have you heard anything from Harrison Ford? Well, well tell him what, what he... What he... Well, you know, the real capper, you know, was, you know, he said, you know, boys, I, I watched your movie and I watched it again and I want you to know it inspired even me. And it's like, <laughs> you know, it's almost too much. And, and later on in a magazine interview, he, uh, he referenced our film, you know, these kids who uh, in Mississippi that did the shot for shot remake of Raiders in the 80s. And he said, to this day, it remains the single best piece of flattery that George and I have ever received. Wow. From a man who's been awarded the Thalenberg Award and innumerable uh, honors, uh, uh, you know, that's um, pretty staggering. Um, so um, our cup runneth over. I mean, uh, for uh, we've certainly been repaid a hundredfold for every time that we ever were tempted to give up in the seven years of making this film. Um, Thank God we didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now there's talks of Hollywood taking your story and making a fictionalized version of it. Uh, what's the status of that uh, project, and uh, how did you first hear about it? What was your reaction? Somebody wanted to film your life. Well, it was. Uh, it, we were pretty involved in the process. I mean, when uh, Harry's article hit, and then um, we started getting all these offers from 
magazines and stuff like that and Vanity Fair approached us and we agreed to an exclusive with them and so we spent the next year sort of uh, working on this with well, the writer did Jim Wendolph uh, wrote this 10,000 word article on us and it um, it was published in the 2004 Hollywood issue of Vanity Fair that's an issue where a lot of people sort of a lot of the Hollywood producers they option stories because it's you know it's there's just so much great writing in it you know and so <clears throat> from that article Rudin was like we got into a bidding war with Rudin and a couple of other studios and uh, to do a life rights deal you know to say okay uh, this is great we want to like lock you guys down for the next couple of years and and develop a story develop a script and put, set it up at a studio so we did just that we got into a life rights deal with uh, with uh, Scott Rudin, and he hired a uh, uh, comic book uh, writer and, and uh, artist Daniel Klaus to write the script. And uh, so Daniel wrote uh, wrote the script. We worked with Daniel for a good number of months, and and Dan wrote the script. The script got set up at Paramount, and during that time was the it's when you know Brad Gray, who's I think still running the studio, they acquired DreamWorks. So they bought DreamWorks and they brought, you know, Steven's team in and everything like that. Rudin's deal was at Paramount. There was some transitional energy there, too. So what ended up happening is they were pushing the script and sort of shopping it around. Then DreamWorks and Paramount split. Then Rudin broke his deal with, with Paramount and took the rest of his projects um, that were non-Paramount related to Disney. Mm. And so... Um, so the script was still in development and executives were still kind of excited about it, but then it started to cool off and then it was, you know, Indy 4 was in discussion. And so it was Indiana Jones related and we didn't, you know, so it's, um, the project's sort of sitting quiet for right now, you know. <laughs> But the good news is that um, recently, within the last couple of months, after many years of hard work, Eric and I have managed to strike up a book deal. And, um, and so we're currently working with uh, a really amazing writer right now. His name is Alan Eisenstock. And Alan has written a slew of books and m many, many TV shows and great writer. And so we're working with him and an agent out of New York to kind of, uh, we sold the book, so it's already been pre-sold. Uh, to St. Martin's Press, and which is very exciting, and so that opens up, I think, you know, many more, many doors for you know, a movie to be made. You know, so we're not we're not bound to the class script, and we're not bound to anything. So, um, so there's there's hope yet. <laughs> and I also heard that you guys were developing your own project about this whole experience, which would be a documentary. Is there any truth to that rumor? I'm getting some blank faces, or is there any probably probably misunderstanding there? No, um, no, we're. Well, the closest is, as Chris knows, there's to be a book about us uh, from St. Martin's Press, which we're not writing, mm -hmm. but uh, collaborating with Alan, uh, author. No, um, what, what, uh, what you may uh, be thinking of is that uh, we've, uh, as a result of our film being discovered, um, have formed uh, an independent production company called Rolling Boulder Films, <laughs> and we're working on a slate of new projects, including... Um, you know, our first one of the gate, uh, not a remake, and uh, and not about us uh, either. Um, an original uh, film called What the River Takes, which is a Southern Gothic action adventure, um, set in uh, Mississippi. So that's that's what we're working on currently. And uh, like Raiders, it meets that really high bar of okay, this is a story that we're passionate enough about to spend seven years or so or more of our lives uh, to make to see real so we're back at it again oh, it's great to hear um, one question I had is that you saw Raiders at a young age do you think that nowadays you can get it as excited about a movie as you did about Raiders then like from seeing Inception or from seeing The Dark Knight or something like that is it something about childhood that sparked that just fever of imagination and your love of that film? Well, your slate is a little cleaner when you're a kid, you know. I mean, I think your imagination, you know, you're, you're a lot more untainted, you're a lot more open, uh, you know, and you've got, as an adult, a lot more experiences and your, your, your palate is a little more fleshed out, you know. Um, that's not to say I can't go to the movies and get absolutely just crazy, you know, electricity up the back of my neck kind of excited 
about a film. Um, uh, I don't know necessarily if there's a film out there that I've seen that I would get as excited about to remake it. Um, I think, you know, Eric, Eric has summed this up so nicely. He said, you know, in watching Raiders, I mean, I still watch Raiders and I can get, I get ex just as excited. I mean, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it, love it, love it. It's just a film that I just absolutely dig. And even though we've done it, um, remaking it still seems like a fun idea, you know. And uh, not just, you know, we wouldn't do it again, you know. Uh, that'd be just kind of silly. But um, <laughs> And there are obviously many great films. Like, <coughs> I love The Godfather, but yet I have no inclination whatsoever to remake it either then as a kid mm -hmm. or even less likely now as an adult. Um, but yeah, Raiders remaking it sounds seems fun even now. Yeah. Um, so it was for I think both of us a, a unique film. Yeah, it's definitely unique. I mean, there's films that I raise I, I raise my expectations for, you know, where I get really excited. I'm like, okay, you know, lights go down, and I'm sitting there in the theater. I'm like, okay, come on, come on, rock my world, man. You know, let's let's go. I want to be excited. I think probably the last film that did that was The Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. That that movie really just was so exciting and it was just like yes, he got it. You know, <laughs> they got the mythology and the energy and they captured it and the characters and the directing and the visuals and it was dark and mm -hmm. exciting and and um and everything so you swept into that world. Yeah, absolutely everything that it, it it should have been and and I was totally taken, you know. And that doesn't that's a rarity these days. You know, I mean, I, I love movies. I watch a lot of them, and, and, uh, but it's a rarity to be swept, you know. But it's nice to know that the power of cinema, magic of movies, can still do that. Yeah, totally, totally. And is there any place where people can keep up with you both online? We don't really have a central... I mean, there's the, the main place where we post our screenings and where there's information about our movie and where you can email us is a place called theraider.net. Um, it's just just that the Raider.net, and it's it's a kind of an Indiana Jones fan portal, um, and our movie is included, and um, they post they post our screening dates there, um, but nothing. Uh, we have a, a Rolling Boulder Films f uh, a page on Facebook that you can that you can like and and uh, we post things on there and you know photos and our movement and you know yeah, that kind of stuff. It's been suggested recently that <coughs> we should post screening dates there, so I expect we probably will. So yeah, Rolling Boulder Which Films. Which I do. Yeah. I mean, when we do stuff, so um, we're out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here. It was amazing talking with you. Thank you. And uh, you can always go online and look up the next time that the Raiders of the Lost Ark adaptation might be playing in your area. For the MacGuffin Podcast, I'm John. T-1000 can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.